We're going to get started again. I hope everyone has managed to grab at least uh, some tap water. I'm sorry we didn't have coffee re ready. We didn't expect to go this long with the presentations. Um, and I'd just like to, uh, I'd just like everyone to take their seats or uh, quiet down and, um, whoa, did, does Jeff, there he is, okay. <laughs> Where'd he go? All right. Um, can we? Yeah, he's got Jay's mic. All right, so I think we can proceed. Um, I'm calling this presentation through the lens of the end game. I got it. Uh, on July 26, 1945, some of the best minds in the world exploded the first atomic bomb at the Trinity site in New Mexico. On August 6, 1945, Nuclear warfare was born with the bombing of Hiroshima. On August 9, 1945, Nagasaki was similarly bombed. On August 15, 1945, J Japan surrendered. I was born on October 23, 1945. I was born in the shadow of the endgame. When Jay suggested that we work together on what he called the Blue Rider moment, the idea excited me on several planes. As part of the introduction to the Sculpture Park website, uh, sorry, as part of the, of the introduction to the Sculpture Park website, I had stated, the purpose of the work is to extend the ancient narrative of art and consequently rekindle the historical spirit of modernism. In addition to viewing the work, which includes the Sculpture Park itself, the goal is to revive the interdisciplinary creative impetus of early modernism and to attain the understanding of art as a serious and credible source of special insight for the evolution of ideas. And under the title, A New Synthesis, science is truth by analogy, art is truth by metaphor. Resonating to, together, they are the new synthesis. When I was younger, I regarded the resonance uh, to be with modern physics and chemistry. As I matured, the resonance became with Darwin and the science of evolution. For me, the period of early modernism became part of my journey from a farm high school in southwest rural Ontario. The unwritten purpose of education was limited to a means of making a living free of the eldest brothers who would inherit the farms. The younger siblings would either remain virtual slaves on those farms or succeed in other professions. Art was simply not in the cards or on anybody's horizon. University was the escape. At that time, London, Ontario had a major university without studio courses, and the city had no art museum. As a consequence, if one were born an artist and lived in a typical rural area, there was no direct contact with art. Art was a self-taught and primitive affair, swamping in the innate ability for mimesis. I had chanced upon a tiny, new, and experimental liberal arts university in Michigan, where seminars were the rule, and both art history and to my may to my amazement, studio classes in life drawing and painting were offered. Here I left behind a curriculum for the professions and entered into the excitement of the Enlightenment in art. I do not underestimate the value of the Enlightenment in the German idealists in my education. The United States was a proud child of the Enlightenment, and its history is replete with the triumphs and the flaws of the best thinking of the time. The German idealists proclaimed qualities of art separate from the dominance of philosophers. These arguments allowed art to finally enter, high, uh, enter institutions of higher learning, valued exceedingly beyond the traditional perception uh, of it as craft. As a consequence, I learned to value myself as an artist and to recognize art at the highest level of knowledge. Under the tutelage of a modernist art, a modernist art historian who was himself an artist, I became a proficient abstract painter. My, liberal, my liberation by liberal arts integrated with art history and studio courses freed me to eventually become what I was truly born to be, a sculptor. That evolution was realized in graduate school and since hammered out by the market. My obligation to that liberation is now manifest in the sculpture part. Modernism until 1914 is my first realization as an artist. It is therefore indelibly personal. I found it highly compelling to revisit this period from where I began as an artist. This was not for empty nostalgia, but to measure 45 years of critical experience. As you can assume from the evidence of the work in the previous forums, there is a highly developed overview to this one as well. 
The entity of the sculpture park represents the transparent and unconstrained context of the work. In this forum, cultural historians will approach this critical period of the descent of my work. In order to describe the lens through which I now revisit early modernism, I want to return to the shadow of the unfolding endgame. In August of 1949, the Soviet Union tested its first nuclear weapon. The end game was on. In November of 1952, the first thermonuclear explosion vaporized the island of Alujalab in the Marshall Islands. The hydrogen bomb was born. The explosive and radiation yield was many orders of magnitude higher than the Hiroshima or Nagasaki bombs. In August of 1953, the Soviet Union exploded its first hydrogen bomb. The shadow darkened and spread globally throughout the 1950s. We became certain of mutually assured destruction, regardless of either side's preparation for victory. In 1960, Herman Kahn published On Thermonuclear War. In it, he posited scenarios for alternatives to mutual annihilation. In spite of his arguments, or because of them, these alternatives appear equally absurd to the possibilities of a, dooms a doomsday machine which he cogitates. This doomsday machine and Herman Kahn will be central to Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove, released in 1964. Kahn's arguments rationalize megadeth. The destruction of major cities is exchanged in favor of ending escalating war. Megadeth becomes transactional. This approach is once again published by Herman Kahn in 1962 in thinking about the unthinkable. The, un the end game has alternate outcomes all wholly abominable and absurd to any except military planners. In 1962, I received the Cuban Missile Crisis for my 17th birthday. We actually expected annihilation at any time. London, Ontario was in the line of, continuous, of a continuous industrial belt from Illinois through Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, and upstate New York. I knew that there had to be another way through this, and it took another year and my first real existential crisis. I began to look at art and started writing. I know now that I could only do this as an a priori cognition and in an ad hoc way. I had no plan where it might lead. Eventually, it led to my undergraduate education and my first emergence as an artist. It was at this time that I encountered a thought that was profound enough to stay with me all these years and help form my definition of art. The way I remember this is that I was reading an article by Simone de Beauvoir while on a bus at the age of 19. I say this is the way I remember it because I have not been able to find the quotation anywhere. Still, I attribute it to her because it affected me so profoundly and my memory seems so specific. She was speaking of the collaboration of occupied France with the Holocaust, how ordinary people, station masters, engineers, all those people routinely doing their ordinary jobs in the infrastructure of murder were certain of their own morality. She contrasted that with individuals who acted under great risk to themselves to save the condemned. Her conclusion was that our very existence itself depends on our acts of individual conscience. I now had two parallel individual existential necessities, art and acts of conscience. It would take another 20 years of maturity for them to fuse. Eventually, this formed one of my tenets of my definition, art is an act of will in accord with a mature conscience. First, I had to pass through the second existential, existential crisis in 1979. The shift of the cultural center after World War I and the post-World War II era naturally focused on the displacement of European culture to America. Regardless of what the Europeans thought of American culture at the time, their influence would make American artists the heirs of European modernism. Among the artists of this displacement are sculptors Archipenko and Jacques Jacques Lipschitz, painters Marcel Duchamp, George Groves, Joseph Elbers, Hans Hoffmann, Mark Chagall, and Willem de Kooning, writers Isaac Bashevis Singer and Thomas Mann, and composer Arnold Schoenberg, just to name a few. Uh, this shift to America, followed by its victories in an intact emergence from World War II, placed American artists in the focal point of the world. Among those artists, Grounded in European modernism, David Smith was the natural departure point for my evolution. Part of the following is paraphrased from a letter to Jay Winter on June 12, 2010. As an inveterate evolutionist and progressive artist, I perceived an almost insurmountable problem when I returned to art history, and specifically the work of David Smith as my point of departure. 
The fractures to early modernism that we have discussed as a point of departure for our project had long ago affected the direction of art. Humpty could never be put, back, be put together again, so that was not the issue. It was that history had reached an apparent dead end. The Cold War had left the thinking members of our generation as dead men walking. The doomsday machine central to Dr. Strangelove was conceived by Hermann Kahn on, on, on thermonuclear war published in 1960. The inevitability of the terminal firestorms were a given long before the deadly possibility of nuclear winter was conceived. To approach the meaning of the insights and themes, that's insights and themes of the sculpture part, we need to return to 1979. The promise of the Carter pre presidency in 1976 was that, moral and highly, that a moral and highly educated man, he was a nuclear engineer, might finally lead America out of the dysfunctional maze of the past many years. In the end, we watched his presidency disintegrate with the resurgence of tribalism in Iran that culminated with the American hostage incident and was quickly followed by the Soviet invasion of, of Afghanistan. The art world was weak, corrupt, irrelevant, and hopeless. Why bother? Why indeed? The art world was not the source of art. I had to face that I was dying inside as an artist. At first, I was able to return to work out of sheer need. As I have stated, I had decided to challenge art history for a potential creative run. It was a final gamble. The magazine Science published Nuclear Winter, Global Consequences of Multiple Nuclear Explosions in 1983 by Turco Toon, Ackerman, Pollock, and Sagan. It was with that final confirmation that I arrived at the insight of the end of the age of agriculture uh, as a means to keep working. By recognizing the end of the age and understanding it, one could work beyond it provided that we could maintain our current survival on a day-to-day, year-to-year basis. This was hardly quixotic. It was a question of no chance for, su for survival versus some possibility, however small. As I earlier stated in the introduction to this forum, I was surprised that art was capable of itself evolving knowledge, and that this knowledge would have remained encoded in the work were it not for the arguments presented to me that they might have value in written form to future generations. I want to make it clear that the insights do not in any way imply a new ideology or any other prescription. I have no interest in having to convince others of their inherent truth. The insights are intrinsic to the work already completed from 1980 to the present. They are one artist's means to working through the environment of anti-art of the omnipresent absurdity realized since and including the modern 30 years war from 1914 to 1945. The essential working concepts that evolved with and from the work between 1979 and 1984 have so far been condensed to the end of the age of agriculture and the definition of art as an act of will in accord with the mature conscience. As such, the insights are realized as ideas in the sculptures. I present them firstly as a gift to me that I in turn offer to anyone who might also perceive their benefit. I have spoken of the origins of the definition of art. Now I want to speak about how, um, how the concept of the end of the age of agricultural, evol agricultural evolved. As I planned, as I advanced through the early 1980s for my position of challenging art history, I simultaneously worked my way back through David Smith and his American contemporaries to the source of modernism itself. Eventually I arrived at Donatello's Mary Magdalene as a starting point. The question that naturally followed was, when could modernism be perceived to have fully arrived? That was difficult to answer. The full arrival, if it could be said to exist, would likely be uh, at some great cultural pivot point. Could that pivot point, could that pivot be identified? From the late uh, I, Enlightenment onward, there had been an extraordinary number of innovations and rapid expansions of knowledge. Apart from the explosion in experimental art, one would have many obvious choices the American Revolution, the electrification of North America and Europe, the invention of the process of synthetic ammonia, relativity physics, the Russian Revolution, just to name a few. I reached a conclusion that none changed the world more, more radically than strategic bombing. In the time that I was doing this thinking, the magazine Scientific American ran an article on how agriculture ended the age of hunting and gathering in Europe. 
Until the advent of agriculture, Europe had been naturally covered in forest. In short order, as agriculture became adopted, the entire continent uh, to the Iberian Peninsula was cleared for farmland. 35,000 years of hunting and gathering by modern humans that had occurred since the first migration from Africa, uh, from Africa to Europe ended by 5,000 years ago. It occurred to me that if agriculture could end an entire age of human cultural development, so too could the age of agriculture end. It was plain to me that agriculture was based on the securing of land and assuring the next year's crops. It followed that all the institutions of civilization were based on these premises, including the invention of a warrior class that had historically come to dominate all by assuring the necessary security. But since World War II, none could claim to have that, uh, to have that security, and above all, no one could claim to guarantee it. Yet all of the institutions of civilization were founded on those principles. This thinking was also in line with the current industrialization and global distribution of food production itself. Manufactured fertilizer and advanced growing methods allowed for production of food literally anywhere. And advanced mechanization and farming techniques had reduced the need for massive labor input. In the 1980s, the common figure was that one American farmer could feed an estimated 76 people. By the 1990s, one American farmer could feed an estimated 100 people. Very deep and much thought was required to re realize this insight. Eventually, I concluded that the absurdity that was characteristic of the race for advanced strategic weapons was the inability and hence the failure of our institutions to be able to recognize and address the potential of this entirely new reality. The institutions and much of our actual thinking were rooted in a 10,000 year age that had ended. It was, I was quite aware in 1979 that the basis for an advanced technological economy was based on military priorities. Thus, the advanced economy ubiquitously carried the stigma that its prime engine of research had become the very military industrial complex about which Eisenhower finally warned in his farewell address in 1961. Of course, his warning was obviously long after the fact anyway. In less than 50 years, the applications of air warfare from dirigibles through fixed-winged aircraft and intercontinental ballistic missiles finally ended a 10,000-year age. Fundamental principles of the age of agriculture, security of person guaranteed by the possession of protected territory was violated by global access from the air. Strategic bombing, originally conceived as destruction of the other side's ability to make war, became tacitly acknowledged by the end of World War II to mean the destruction of cities. In the post-war World War II period, this evolved rapidly to thermonuclear warfare and came to include the secondary destruction by nuclear fallout, and eventually to the awareness of potential nuclear winter. Ultimately, the imperatives of the warrior class and its institutions were no longer able to protect civilians at any point on the earth. The social contract of 10,000 years had ended. The enlightenment that had meant to liberate civilization with the spirit of knowledge had evolved through the, that knowledge, the means to destroy civilization itself. Under the most extreme circumstances, it may prove, prove to have evolved the means for extinction of the very humanity it meant to uplift. For me, art had become the means to work through this, but first one had to acknowledge the end of the age of agriculture. It was not the spirit of the Enlightenment, but rather the exploitation of science within the failing values of the end of this age that led to the dilemma confronting existence itself. In Art Beyond War, presented at the 2010 Company of Ideas Forum, I wrote, that to be able to measure the inherent value of an artist's works is to be able to accept each artist's perception of the extent of all human knowledge in that artist's time. Original art is created beyond the limits of that extent and informs rather than reflects. Consequently, original art itself becomes located on the map of the human soul and in so doing adds to the sum of all human knowledge. Original art and the human soul evolve together. It is important to note that the spirit of original art is certainly not prescriptive by its nature. As a map of the human soul, it is descriptive, allowing future generations of artists to themselves evolve and enlarge the map. Individual artists may be bound to their beliefs, but the spirit of original art must exist independent of those beliefs in order to survive as values for future generations. 
Further in the paper I wrote regarding Darwin and the origin of species, nature by the passage of time and by the genetic sculpting of life has created a history that is crushingly honest and constantly probing the future. It is thus simultaneously innocent and guilty of the most destructive crimes that lead to the most magnificent creations. Without life, there is no witness to this awesome and terrifying creative unfolding of the universe. As far as we know, we fragile humans are the only fully cognizant witnesses. With this capability comes the great responsibility of this knowledge. This responsibility is a priori in those who are born artists. The act of will that I describe in my definition of art is the act of witnessing and recording this knowledge. This is the highest form of values, the recognition of the value of life itself. Therein resides the mature conscience. This is the essence of our being. Art is the map of the human soul. Evolution in time will continue with or without human existence. Progress will remain inexorable and unrelenting, even if we manage to destroy our necessary environment and perish in a nuclear winter. Art is the authentic internal scream against the suicidal nature of our rooted tribal culture. Finally, to view modernism through the compound lens of maturity, another element is added. At the 2010 Company of Ideas Forum, I spoke of the 35,000-year proven history of art. Agriculture has a 10,000-year history. Civilization has a 5,000-year history. To an artist, civilization may indeed be a temporary evolutionary upstart. Because I perceive the human soul as the sum of all human knowledge, how can it be any less? I highly value civilization and its rapid expansion of that knowledge and its contribution to the evolution of the human soul. However, should civilization prove to be short-lived by its own hand and humanity manages to survive, artists will continue as they did before civilization. Why understanding this is critical is to differentiate the history of art as a statement of the viewer from the, that of the artist. In the presentation of 2010, I showed the spirit of the artist fused with the subject from the Chauvet Cave uh, some 35,000 years ago through Otto Dix in the 20th century. I discussed the history of art by artists perceiving the encoded spirit of art manifest in the essence of liberation and originality passed from generation to generation of artists. In drawing artists from the mass of slaves required for civilization in the age of agriculture, the artist had the advantage of becoming a petty functionary with a significantly improved life over peasant farm slaves, quarry workers, and soldiers. Philosophers, high-end pedants of the warrior class, debated aesthetics while artists were at, the best, at best lowly craftsmen. Indeed, they were petty functionaries manifestly providing symbols of immortality to the right to rule of the warrior class. The spirit of original art remained wholly encoded throughout the European history of art by artists. For reasons that I discussed in Art Beyond War, it became manifest as defiance in the Renaissance. I chose Donatello's Mary Magdalene as the beginning of modernism. In the case of the Italian Renaissance, the defiance was supported by the assumption to power of the upstart middle class of merchants and merchant bankers. However, until the Enlightenment evolved, an independent middle class of artists centered in France in the 19th century Artists remained petty functionaries throughout the world. Of course, as the middle class grew, so too would the natural pool of artists born into it. Simultaneously, an open market for art grew that would become the symbol of middle class evolution. In 1874, a group of artists challenged the then existing market in France for an independent statement for art itself. Arguably freed from the petty function of mimesis by the photograph, as well as the artist possessing moderate financial independence, the spirit of original art was once again liberated from the preconceptions of the market. These artists broke civilization's long-standing relationship with artists as petty functionaries. Art would now evolve openly and rapidly. I have separated this new modernism in art into four parts that may also inform cultural history. 1874 to 1900, assertion, 1900 to 1914, radical assertion, 1914 to 1962, defiance, 1962 to the present, resignation stated as defiance. What has been encoded artist to artist for 5,000 years now would assert itself as the actual subject of art in the following period of radical assertion. 
In art, revolutionary means is a marketing term. Art is subject, as is all evolution, to a continuum of overlapping time. This is certainly the case of the period of assertion, 1874 to 1900. 1874 is particularly chosen because it is the year of the highly significant exhibition mounted by the independents whose work had been rejected by the Salon. The marketing system of the time, uh, the marketing time of, uh, the marketing time of, marketing system in the time, uh, at the time in France. 1900 is an arbitrary demarcation. It is based on the high expectations of the new century. Many of the artists of the assertion period lived and worked well into the 20th century. Of them, three are acclaimed as a point of departure by almost every group in the period of radical assertion, Cezanne, Van Gogh, and Gauguin. Like their contemporary scientists' search for the essential elements of the universe, artists were searching for the essential elements of original art. Freed from the prescription of mimesis, art could take any number of forms, as, as in the great experimentation of music between the time of the Renaissance and the sublime counterpoint of Bach, where the elements might contain lyrics or not. So too in the great experiment in the liberation of painting and sculpture, the composition of the abstract elements came to be the narrative of art itself. To the result, the result was a frenzy of experimentation throughout the European world that was brought to America in the armory shows of 1913 in New York and Chicago. Unfortunately, the new art and emerging artists became swallowed by the festering nationalism of Europe. The outbreak of war in 1914 would lead to the respite of 1918 to 1939, while the malignancy of Europe's history built a new generation to replace the lost cannon fodder. A great 31 years war was underway. A number of artists would die in the first installment of the war on both sides, notably Maka, Mark, and Mark in German uniform, Raymond Duchamp Vion and Apollinaire wearing France's. Others like Brock would survive serious wounds. Those who found that they could still make art after facing the absurdity of this new and terrible industrial warfare would form a natural period of resistance. This was the first great test of the ability of the new art to survive. Resistance that, resistance that, it, that, that wins is born in defiance, and defiance becomes its permanent identity. That which fails ends in resignation. When rebellion and resistance become a marketable style, it is resignation stated as defiance. Otto Dix and George Groves directly addressed resistance. Confronting resignation stated as defiance is the means to solve the enigma of Marcel Duchamp. Marcel Duchamp was an artist who moved directly from radical assertion to resignation stated as defiance. It is impossible to understand how he could be regarded as anything but a failure as an artist. His positions on painting and art itself were necessarily self-fulfilling. Anyone but a fool would realize that to continue, to continue, would have to be recognized for resignation masquerading as defiance. He finally and rightfully did resign in 1923 to play chess full time. His most biting criticism, the ready-mades, became co-opted in a statement of reverse irony when they were required as museum pieces after being recreated. Duchamp became cynically revived in the 1960s when it became clear how marketable resignation stated as defiance would turn out to be. He died in 1968 resurrected as a market hero. The marketing of resignation stated as defiance continues to dominate the art world. It is a world of self-induced annihilated val values bereft of the spirit liberated in 1874. Duchamp's, Duchamp's legacy has been to legitimize the artist's return to petty functionary, a readily replaceable manufacturer buried deep beneath the layered infrastructure of the cultural behemoth, the cultural behemoth. There can be no, hmm, I was born in the shadow of the end game. I am an artist. Art is an act of will in accord with a mature conscience. There can be no resignation. The artist is witness to existence itself. Art is a celebration. Uh, thank you very much. I would I'm assuming you want to open this up to questions from the panel first, and then sure. we'll, maybe we'll go back and forth. I hope, the, I hope the students at least have a lot of questions. I, I heard some things addressed specifically 
as well to the field of cultural history. Uh, and I heard uh, a lot of comments addressed to some of the themes in the papers. So um, I would just invite anybody who wants to start off. Let me, let me start. Yeah, please. Can I ask you, Jeffrey, do you share my view that uh, conscience is social by definition? That it's not an individual uh, category or property that we have as separate individuals, but we have it by virtue of a shared language uh, that we learn when we're young. No. Well, this is, I think this is a fundamental point. The word conscience, I think, is critical to your approach. Yes. And once more, I'm engaged in the art of translation, if I can. Mm. Uh, and it strikes me that there are two different pathways here. Yes. Uh, one of them involves the, the notion of inspiration and possibly of, uh, uh, of, of, of obligation, which are also important words for you. Uh, and I take the word obligation to be, by definition, social. Uh, inspiration may not be, I'm not sure. But we, when we use the term a mature conscience, I think we have two choices. One of them going towards the social and one of them going away. The, the, I've been spending a reasonable amount of time trying to work out why the King James Version of the Bible took the Hebrew, uh, which the phrase for conscience in the King James Version is from Elijah, a still small voice of conscience. And the Hebrew from which they translated, and they were learned men, this was not uh, trivial, at all. The Hebrew is called mamad daka, and the Hebrew means the thin voice of silence. That's exactly what it means, kol de mama daka, the thin voice of silence. So the King James Version translated that to the still small voice of conscience. That's the, the English version. So we go from silence to conscience. And one of them, may be a personal quantity, silence, although I do think there are social dimensions to that too. But I still think that the evidence of um, the work of many artists that you cited, uh, for example, the, uh, uh, the work of Simone de Beauvoir, where you talked mm -hmm. about the, the, the individual acts of conscience, I still believe they are social acts. No, acts of individual conscience. I know. I believe no, no, that no, acts... No, not, not individual acts of conscience. All right, no. Acts I, of individual conscience. I think acts of individual conscience are social. They don't exist outside of a framework. I mean, and I, I would I'd say that we have, therefore, two pathways. No, no. The, the, can I explain of course. how I see this? The acts are social, yes. Okay? But conscience is something else that I see, and this is time that I've spent on thinking very hard about the human genome. And I think that very soon we're going to find a continuum of genes. And I'll use the word switched on, but it really, it's scientifically, it's expressed. They use the word expressed for switched on genes. But there will be a cluster of genes that will be identified as conscience. And that we choose among our leaders or the leaders themselves come forward based on that continuum. And so you're going to have a pure psychopath with none, with none turned on, and you're going to have a, a continuum of genes turned on throughout that continuum. Each way and each, each sort of way we bring f people forward in those choices are going to be brought forward on that continuum of how many of those genes are switched on. My argument is that uh, artists, by nature, have the most amount switched on, if not all of them. And so when we deal with questions like that, we really do, you don't want an artist, for example, as a politician. He's not going to be a very good politician. So how you choose these people are, are, are quite different than how they're born. They're born with this level of conscience. Now, when you're born with certain genes turned on or turned off, it's a predilection towards these things. You can beat that out of anybody. Uh, clearly, somebody can be born with an incredible amount of these genes turned on, and you can alter those people by abusing them terribly, doing any of those other things. Uh, this is an important part of what I, I think is missing from most of the humanities that I've read in, in, the, in the last 30 or 40 years. None of them deal with Darwin and Darwin's humanism, and they deal with Darwin. I, I think that they just ignore Darwin. Part of that, I think, was the, 
is mentioned in, in, in other papers, and your own paper for that matter, on separating, uh, on the nationalization of science. Darwin was British. You don't hear the Germans talking about Darwin. He's not even mentioned, the French don't mention Darwin. The British kept that science going. Crick and Watson were British. So they kept that science that Darwin had suggested there. Now, the way that it, it crept into other parts of our language, the way that it's crept into our language is in social Darwinism. And um, naturally, there's just, just a complete negation of that. I mean, no one really wanted that. I really sensed that most of the Marxists really wanted to be Lamarckians. They really wanted to have a sense that you could actually alter, alter people's uh, genetic being somehow or another through social interaction. That doesn't work. But why I differentiate the two so strongly is, is the elastic nature of morality. It's elastic. And that was exactly what I read at 19 into Simone de Beauvoir's point, was that the elasticity, I, I, as I recall this, and, I, I, and, and I, Jeremy, if you could find that article, I read that article, I think it was in the New York Times, and I can't find it anywhere. Leva thinks that it's probably in the galley somewhere, you know, like somewhere down deep in the, in the heart of that thing. I can't find it anywhere. I can't find it on the internet. I can't find it on JSTOR. And I know I didn't make it up. So it's there somewhere, and I just don't have it. Um, but the point that she was making, which I think was really, really important, and I, I, I recall it, but I, because of my sense of recall is not perfect on this, she also talked about these petty functionaries being churchgoers and going to church every Sunday and then on Monday going and creating, yeah. And so what that says, and this is the part that has bothered me so much about uh, uh, and, and why I've tried to separate conscience from morality is that morality has a sliding scale. It moves wherever you want to go. If you, want to, if you declare war on Jews, then they're fair game. And so if they're fair game, it seems to me that morality says you should kill them. So what happens uh, with the sliding scale of morality is the way that that remains social. The acts of uh, an individual's con or conscience, no, sorry, the, the acts of uh, individual conscience, not the individual acts, but the acts of an individual's conscience, strikes me much more of answering to something higher and inside. And that higher and inside is the way that I look at Darwin. That's the choice. That is the OK. Uh, Jay's, Jay's put a little pressure on the second part of your definition of art, the one dealing with conscience. I want to ask you a bit about the first part, uh, the idea of the imposition of will or the, mm. uh, you know, the issue of the artist being basically uh, intentionally uh, uh, creating and uh, imposing uh, his or her will on uh, the material. Uh, I can understand, well, maybe I'm giving a slight uh, variation, but, but will yeah, certainly is crucial. Okay, but the will is in accord with the mature conscience, and the mature conscience doesn't have that definition here. Or, a mature conscience is a fully conscious right, conscience. So, let, so let's say it's a will filtered through a notion of responsibility, a reflexivity about its implications. Yes, yes. But nonetheless, will is the crucial yes, term. Yes, And that's where you begin. Yes. Now, I can understand why you're hostile to Duchamp, who obviously tries to... Uh, in some sense, uh, decenter the work away from the will of the creator and found objects or ready-mades or uh, something that's aleatory, something that uh, is not uh, an expression. So it's an anti-expressive view of art, uh, a view that takes us away from the all-powerful quality of the creative genius and the one who imposes his or her will. And I think it's an interesting dialogue that one could have between those two positions, and of course 20th century art, 21st century art has engaged in that dialogue. But I was immediately, uh, I immediately came to mind with a third alternative in a way, which is not one that I often draw on, but uh, clearly is relevant, and that's Heidegger's notion of, of the uh, work of art. I mean, Heidegger has a very powerful uh, critique of the importance of will, uh, critique of it in uh, Nietzsche, but critique of it in general. And his alternative is one that emphasizes the object as uh, disclosing something, not uh, being an expression, not being 
uh, somehow the uh, subject imposing his or her will, but a disclosure. Now, it could be a disclosure of being something that, you know, maybe itself problematic. But I must say, to be honest, looking at this uh, extraordinary complex here, I had a very powerful sense of disclosure rather than imposition. I mean, there's a lot of you here. There's a lot of that, you know, it's, this is signature art in a context that you created. But the sense of the works being in uh, the context of this extraordinary nature, the rhythms that they expose, the sense of form that uh, they uh, both juxtapose and somehow echo in the environment, uh, the sense of the works themselves not being an imposition. I mean, I, they're small in comparison to this incredible space. So there seems to me, and this is often the case, artists don't fully express what they're really doing. There seems to be more disclosure than will. Uh, now, what is disclosed, we could then, you know, try to sort of unravel it. Maybe it's not a single formula. But I wonder if, if you've thought of that as an alternative way to conceptualize uh, the power of the work uh, rather than the stress on a will that is even filtered through uh, a, a conscience that uh, has maturity. Oh, okay. Um, yes, I have thought about it, but th this is the way that I think about it. The first is, is that to make a statement of existence itself is the first struggle against the absurdity of the full awareness of your, or of your consciousness. That is probably the most difficult thing, is why the hell care? And so the statement of existence takes an enormous amount of will to move against that absurdity. And that, I find, is very, very important, because with full consciousness, you're also fully conscious of the absurdity of your act. So it requires uh, the will to exist, and that's what I'm talking about. And the will to exist is that recognition of existence itself, both as an artist, and I told you, well, I've said that it was very hard to, it, 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 it is a long time to fuse those two things together. You have the will of the artist to exist with the necessity of the artist to exist, which you feel very strongly inside yourself. And how do you accommodate the concept of, of, a, of, a, of conscience also as a means in a statement of going? So if you were making a self-indulgent statement, clearly you're not, you're not crossing that line. So the concept of disclosure is in the statement of existence itself, in the celebration of existence itself. And if you can celebrate your own existence, that's part of the part of giving. That's part of the map of the human soul. So now you're disclosing the map of the human soul. That is disclosure. So the act of will then at that particular time is not a, a will of imposition. It's the ability to overcome the inertia, the essential inertia that comes with the recognition of absurdity. And that ain't easy. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll continue the discussion. Uh, since you quoted the Simone de Beauvoir, uh, uh, I would like to show the contradiction in her and perhaps solve the problem uh, between you. Uh, she speaks about acts of conscience, uh, but when she could have acts of conscience, she never had them during the Second World War. And she even had anti tension acts a lot. And uh, so I was thinking in, in the way Jay was saying about being social. Uh, can you be a philosopher and give great ideas like the one you are taking from this article she wrote like 15 years after the Second World War, knowing that when she had the capacity to think about what she could do during this terrible time, she did it and she, she just went on with her own life. I think the worst. The worst she did during Sir, the war was to. <laughs> She's very unhappy. Uh, yeah. How the future great feminist will help uh, Jean Paul Sartre draw up his uh, Jewish girlfriend uh, in 1940 uh, when it was not a good time for a French Jew to be out by herself. And uh, what she wrote after the war was, you don't become, you don't, you are not born as a woman, you become a woman. 
So I was wondering if we could push that, that we are not born as human beings. You become. You are not born as an artist. You become. And uh, again, by this conscience, or by the act of conscience, or by both together, and how you reconcile the social, the representation, the cultural, and the real acts that you do. Uh, mature conscience, by my thinking, is full consciousness. And so that only comes with knowledge. So there's no way that, uh, by this definition, no child can create a, a work of art. It's just not possible to do. There's not enough information there to be able to have a mature conscience. So absolutely, I am agreeing with you completely with what you're saying. Her maturity and her recognition in, in this time after the war is probably by her own, you're right, it's, it's by her own maturity of what she knew and what she learned. So yes, you do grow into it. So the only way that I can see is, is that you, to become fully conscious is to attempt to become fully conscious as much as you can. And that means accounting for whatever knowledge you might have. Now that's, you know, that's obviously no one's going to know everything. And, but the sum of all human knowledge is what I see artists mapping. So as they map it and, and original art comes about, they become part of that knowledge itself. And so that's part of, that's part of the act of, of making art. Does that, does, that, does that handle it? Yeah, at all? yeah okay. Uh, and uh, Frank, but I just wanted to ask if you could just try and speak up so we don't have to boost the board too much so we don't have that problem. And that's okay. I know it feels like a conversation up here, but we have about 20 people mm. trying to listen in. So um, we're going to go to Frank first, and then we'll. Um, I heard correctly, Jeff. I think you said something like uh, art might have value to future generations. Are you, were you expressing a concern there that perhaps art may not have value? Or were you speaking of art in a, in a holistic sense or in a, in a particular individual art? Um, and the reason I ask that, two things come to mind. One is that you spoke about art as having a 35, 36,000 year history, civilization having a 5,000 year history. It seems to me that art is, has outlasted civilization, will it continue? And the other thing that comes to mind is, is our artists now sort of petty functionaries and so concerned with uh, selling and, and making a livelihood that they've gone back to perhaps, as, as the way I see uh, Renaissance artists being functionaries to their patrons who supported them and kept them, kept them going with uh, paintings to do and work to do for them. Are we coming back to that now? And is art losing its, its importance in the 21st century? Or, or what do you think? The art world, which is the epicenter is New York, but I think it has imitators all over. So the, there's possibilities that it could be altered. In the 1960s, it went through a complete commodification. And as it, you know, when the when the artists broke out in 1874, they were on top of their market. They, they, was, they were on top and in complete control. They they were showing themselves. They went out into that world. I in the 1980s, I started to count where artists mattered anymore, and mm. they it went down and down and down. And my own experience was is we've got manufacturers. We've got we've become petty manufacturers. We produce product for this market. And we don't really matter if you don't behave or give us what we can sell. Well, there's 10,000 people waiting for your, for your position. So we'll, we'll, you, you really don't mean anything. So it's got to do with commodification. I, I have tried to do something here where art is not commodified. And so that's the, the, that's the purpose of the sculpture park is to at least have some place where it's not commodified. And if there's a, any chance of it surviving, it's going to survive because it hasn't been commodified. The market, the way that it is now, has reduced an artist to simply being a minor supplier. So, uh, and part of that is, is that part of it is, 
and, and a lot of people will deny it, but the sense of that Duchamp brings to it, which is uh, um, resignation, re resignation uh, uh, masquerading as right. masquerading as defiance, is really what you're going to see a lot of, and that's why you see this avant-garde. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's almost guaranteed that any artist who doesn't sell and immediately who comes to the forefront is out. I mean, don't even bother. So there, the time when dealers, I had a dealer in, in Toronto who worked very hard to survive and support artists through the, the 1950s. Toronto was a tough place then. Nobody was really interested. And she and her husband worked very hard through that time. They kept a framing shop, which was, everybody started to make fun of them in the 1960s for keeping. They sold paints, they did anything. They sold paper just to keep the art alive that they were doing. And no, no dealer does that anymore. I mean, it's just simply not done. So from an artist's point of view, you're not going to find dealers like that. That was a very special dealer, and that was a very special time. And, uh, that's disappeared. My experience in New York has entirely disappeared. So if the dealers themselves don't nurture art and, right. and stay with artists you know, for a long time, 10, 20, 30 years, the time that it takes to actually develop art, patronize them, keep them going, that's what the, that's what the dealers did in the, when there was no market. And soon as, there's a mar as soon as there was a market, it, they, lost. they went the other way. So, if art can find places where it's not commodified, and, and, uh, and, and many artists, it's, it's really interesting. I have this quote from David Smith on, on artists, and this is him, and he was even really well known at the time. He wasn't selling anything. He said, sculptures don't sell anything. You're just simply going to have to support yourself in order to do that. Mm -hmm. So from a sculptor's point of view, that's sort of built into it, the way that I see it. If you can't find some way of being self-supporting. And there are artists out there who will do that. They'll drive cabs, they'll just do whatever it takes to survive and keep going. Just to survive. And those are the people who are making art. Those yeah. are the people who are doing it. But if you view it from the point of view of the art world, it's a commodity and it's quite a cheapened commodity, actually, if you think about it. Um, just wanted to invite Maria and uh, then James yeah. to, and, then if, and also, if, and I'm looking out, if there's anybody who wants to just pop up their hand or make eye contact, uh, especially even just comments or questions, feel free. I'll be looking. Can I um, develop the oh, artwork point? Uh, uh, you can, but actually I think we'll okay. stay oh. Well, leave. just a you know, couple of comments. Um, inspiration, uh, intuitiveness, that's something that you know, I'd love to hear you speak about because your work is, you know, to my way of thinking, full of it. Um, but just another, another um, aside, what is a young artist supposed to do? Okay, they can drive a cab, they can teach, they can do all sorts of things, but isn't, and I know as a writer, it, it's, it's, you know, wonderful writing books and, uh, uh, you know, the act and the creativity and the intuition and all of that. But... I have to interface with an audience. There has to be a connection somehow. And, you know, we're really lucky because, you know, we've gone around the park with you and you've talked about your work. But how do you feel about, I mean, one, what is a young artist supposed to do? Are they supposed to drive a cab? And how are they going to get their work out there? And what about you? Um, we're here, people who come to the island, obviously, can come and look at your work, but is there any way you, you can have, oh, show these wonderful works to two more people? Um, do you see what I'm getting at? That don't you want an audience? Don't you want the feedback of an audience? Is that important to you? Or is it just the creativity, the actual doing, the actual placing these works in this, in this landscape? Um, originally, going to New York was the only way to really get the work out yeah. there. And it was so bruising for a sculptor in New York that um, um, 
I, I said that the only dealer that had the space to show my work did show my work. But from that point on, I was to be owned and, and, and a pet, uh -huh. pet puppy on the back burner. So that was no way to live. So if that were, if that's the argument for success, then it was one that I, I just couldn't live uh -huh. with. Uh -huh. So um, I look at the statement of existence itself as a statement of defiance. That is the statement of defiance. To survive being an artist and to get through it and get through a lifetime even, you know, and, and be doing it after 30, 40, 50, 60 years, uh -huh. that's a statement of defiance. And that's a statement of your own existence. And I don't know now that you really expect anything beyond that. One of the most difficult decisions that I saw in, and, and I, I couldn't overcome in myself was ever teaching. Because what could I teach people? Go out and drive a cab, do whatever it takes mm -hmm. to, to keep going. Because that's the only thing that there is really out there for you. So that, you know, that's a terrible mm -hmm. point of view. Um, so I wouldn't teach. I just felt that that was just, it was almost criminal to teach, mm -hmm. you know? So I, if people have this within them, it will emerge, and it does. And it does on this island, a number of people on this and island. And the audience, the feedback? Do you, are you getting it? Well, the audience, yes. As a matter of fact, this is what's so good about the island right now, is, is that quite surprisingly, there is very positive feedback on the island. Uh, does it need to expand more? My thoughts, about, my thoughts about the actual park itself is, is that it probably has a stronger outreach bringing writers together that can publish and take it out than it does trying to move sculpture out of here. Mm -hmm. uh, I did do that in the 80s. I, I showed in, in major places in the, in the 1980s the big pieces. I moved them to Chicago, moved, mm -hmm. moved no, one piece to that. New York, moved yeah. them to Chicago, moved them to uh, Queens Park in Toronto when I left. Toronto, I said, you know, this little lovely park is sitting there. They never show any art in it. One day I'll come back, and I'm going to do a one-man show in this park. And I did. I think I did the first one and maybe the only one. Yeah. So I did that in the 1980s, and I showed at York University. And I had the, the work moving around, and then yeah. we got stuck. We couldn't move it any further. So it came back. And so it was out there. It was great that it was out there. The, I'm not sure that the results of the effort I don't know. Whereas here, it's got to be word of mouth. Mm -hmm. um, okay. One of the, uh, Mark Cohn, who did the, the first writing, which is what we presented the, the area of that nature of the park to the CRA with, we, so that we could set it up on this very high scale of, of what we were doing, said, you know, if you start advertising, you're going to get these vultures from all over the world. They're going to come, and they're going to fill your place all the time. But what it really meant was that these are very empty-headed people that are moving around the world from place to place, and you probably don't really want them there. Mm -hmm. So I would really, I really value the small number of people that we get from the mm -hmm. islands here mm -hmm. who actually come and spend time and look at it and think mm -hmm. about it. And, and so far, that has to do. Okay. But I really think if we want any outreach at all, it's going to have to be with writing, because writing can be published out there in the world. And uh, we, do have, we do have the website. Website is, uh, is nice. It does get things out, at least pictorially out there. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, and I can't, there's no point in going back to New York. I already know what the answers are, right? There's one place to show, and I've burned my bridges there. Mm -hmm. So I, mm -hmm. yeah. I Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> OK, we'll go to James. Yes, to, to carry on and develop this art world point, um, because this park seems to be in many, in many ways an attempt to opt out of that art world, and that's very admirable. And I think uh, in the last 30 or 40 years, much of the best art that is being produced has been a response, an attempt to get out of the art world, whether it's the land art movement or it's David Smith. Um, but at the same time, the very works you showed in your first slide uh, show, the great modernist masterpieces of the early 20th century and the late 19th, they would not have been produced without an art world. And without a network of dealers and collectors and critics um, and magazines that we'll be talking about as well, um, and art galleries and exhibitions, there would be no place, there would be no sphere for that work to have been produced. Um, 
And, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny if we take it all the way back to Chauvet and, uh, and the caves where there was no art world there. I mean, they were, you know, there was no art, well, there was no art back then. I mean, if it was 36,000 years BC, that was 36,000 years before we even had a word for art. Um, so, uh, clearly, I mean, that's, uh, you know, that the art world has become uh, a very influential thing. I mean, clearly it's very problematic. I mean, I'm very much in, involved in the art world uh, today. And when I go around these art fairs, you know, these contemporary art fairs, you know, I was struck with this, this sort of revelation, if you like, that the art world doesn't need art. Um, whereas, you know, in Chauvet, there was no need for an art world. Now it's the, the, the opposite way. But at the same time, um, I wonder what other options are left to us. This is something that other people have raised. I mean, is it the worst, is it the best of many bad systems? Well, one of the things is, is that it wasn't so bad, is what I was saying in the 1950s. When, when the dealers themselves had to work in their dedication to art, they became dedicated to the artist. And when I was looking for that in New York, it was only a pretense by then. It didn't even exist. It was a businessman to businessman discussion on any place where I went. Whereas, you know, you were a petty manufacturer. You weren't an artist anymore. You were a petty manufacturer and you were on the list. And like I said, cause any trouble and we've got 10,000 people who will take your place. So, you know, that's not the art world that attempted to create itself because it had to displace. It was quite threatening when the artists themselves actually succeeded and brought in the kind of, the, the kind of response that they got, epithet or not, right? Mocking or not, that they actually got it. And the artists played that out and they played it out on their own shows. So I don't agree with you. I don't know how important that art world was at that particular point. Uh, to get it started because the artists showed in their own environment at that particular time. They chose themselves and they finally took over the salon itself. So uh, this was the beginning of the artists themselves choosing. The Blue Rider chose themselves. They found their places to show. They had enough patronage to mount those shows, but there was no such thing as art dealers at that point. They must have come afterwards. Not for modernism. So the support system, the support system that must have grown up, which we can imagine at least that grew up from that, whether the support, supporters of that art finally becoming dealers and coming into it and collectors trading among each other, but not at the beginning. I don't agree with you. I don't think so. I think that they, they themselves had control over that first market, and I think that that carried on from 1874 probably right into 1914. Mm -hmm. But some people have even argued that, you know, the artist is, 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 is himself or herself a product of, you know, the art world. You know, that uh, without uh, an art world packaging certain things in certain ways, then you're not going to have the, the figure of the artist, a, a person whose work you can buy the named. You know, that's very much an invention of the Renaissance as well, this idea of wanting a Michelangelo rather than wanting an Annunciation. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, we could, you know, we could say that the institution precedes uh, the individual. Um, but for me, it's just this worry about what, what alternatives are there. You know, for, for, for the, it's, it's fantastic that some artists like yourself can produce work uh, without this fear of being commodified. And I think that's magnificent and is only a good thing. But that's only available to a, a select few. Um, and I wonder where other people would go, what advice you would give to them who cannot do that. Uh, maybe we'll park that just so we got a, a lineup uh, of people wanting. So I'll, we'll get back to that. Where do they go? That was a question echoed, um, but perhaps we'll go to one of our students. Rose? Hi, I, um, I wanted to jump back to the question we started with, which was about the social or the individual um, consciousness. And it's, you explained that the soul is the sum of all human knowledge. So I guess I kind of wanted to ask a question about the nature of that knowledge. Because it seems to me, if we're thinking of a knowledge, it, a knowledge that's very embedded in the time and place and era, then an attempt to map that, um, an attempt to map the human soul seems to be necessarily a social effort to describe what, what is known in the here and now of the artist kind of embedded in the society that he exists in. Whereas if you're speaking of a knowledge that kind of it 
is more total going back, you know, accumulated over 36,000 years or 5,000 years or whatever time period you want to assign to it, then perhaps that allows a more individual consciousness, maybe an attempt to kind of stand, uh, the artist can stand apart from the time he's in, in this attempt to map, map a human soul of total knowledge. So I was, I was kind of wondering if you could speak a little about what kind of knowledge you see the artist is confronting. If we can imagine knowledge like a, an onion, you know, that keeps growing out layer by layer by layer by layer, then uh, the artist lives on his particular part of whatever that layer of that onion is in the time that he's there, right? So if we can just keep imagining that it might grow out that way, the artist at the center is going to know what's close to the center of that particular onion. Now, the artist can only map what the artist himself knows, and that, that's isolated. So I think the comparison that I want to use here, if I can use this analogy, and I have used it before, is that when the sailing ships left Portugal, where the, when they left Europe, they didn't know whether they were driving off the edge of the world or not. They had no idea where they were going. They didn't know where they were. It took until 18, uh, I think 1789, until they knew where the longitude was. So the only way that they could know where they were was by mapping the sky at any given time during a given year. And those became, those were the rudders, those were the, those were the maps of where you might be in an unknown place. So the knowledge of where you might be to go to some place where you might finally be that's a little more of what I'm talking about because it's it's less it's less uh, if you're going to do original art you're going to go out that way you're going to map where you've been and you're going to bring that back to where you are and that becomes a new place that was never known before and it's an interesting thing because once we've mapped even in the 1970s not the entire world had been mapped yet there were parts of Siberia that still hadn't been mapped but ever since GPS every square inch every possible millimeter of the world is a map. That means that wherever you go in the world, you're a tourist. Whereas the exploration of original art means that you're actually exploring things that have never been explored before. And so you're bringing back that level of knowledge. You're bringing back, now it might be the size of a square millimeter. It may not be very large. It's not necessarily mapping the entire human soul. It's mapping the artist's perception of his area of the sky, say, and his travels and what he particularly brings back. And that's a, that's a very isolated map. It's not necessarily the map of the whole thing. Probably never is any more than the vision of that particular artist on the, his part of the onion. Okay, thank you, Ismail Kittel. You're on the list. It's uh, Jeremy next. Just up, uh, and then Sarah. Um, this is, this is continuing in the vein of the question of trying to categorize the individual or social nature of the conscience. And it actually uh, began with Professor Jay's suggestion uh, of the Heidegger's notion of the artist disclosure as being an alternative uh, to art as an act of will. I was very struck by that because I think there are, if, if, if the later Heidegger's notion of, of as artist disclosure gets away from a romantic idea of the individual artist is just kind of by fiat uh, creating art. His earlier notion of conscience, uh, I actually think in some ways is quite parallel uh, to maybe what, 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 what Jeffrey, you're suggesting in terms of this idea of the mature conscience. Uh, and, and, maybe, and maybe it's a disturbing parallel. Um, and what I mean by that is Heidegger sort of basically says that the desire to act in accord with our individual conscience um, is sort of the first gl glimmer of authenticity, the first glimmer of kind of true uh, being within oneself. Um, this model of conscience seems very, ra you know, very kind of paradigmatic of a notion of individual conscience. It's so individual that it, it kind of definitionally has to make no reference to the, so to, to the given social environment. Uh, it has to stay within itself in a very radical way. Because of that, 
this notion of conscience has been very criticized uh, 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 as absolutely for swearing, uh, given moral content, given normative, uh, normative values that are received from the social environment, uh, and this clearly has political, uh, political implications. The, cr the criticisms have political implications, talking about Heidegger pre-World uh, pre War II. Um, you yourself have opposed you know, very clearly the idea of individual conscience to morality in a way that really resonates, uh, I think, with Heidegger's notion of conscience. Um, but at the same time, you clearly have lots of moral concerns. Uh, you're very concerned with nuclear violence. You know, you've flagged the kind of large-scale worries about genetic manipulation, and I think there's a moral charge there to your critique of that movement. So I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm curious how you relate these moral concerns that clearly do drive your work and your thinking to a notion of conscience uh, that seems to necessarily forswear social concern or kind of input about morality uh, from the social environment. Again, it's not just conscience, it's mature conscience. And by mature conscience, I mean fully consciousness, the, the full ability of the weight of your consciousness. Now, that, that full ability of the weight of your consciousness, that's the social. That's the social side of that particular thing. That's the mature conscience part, but not conscience itself. It doesn't separate conscience itself. So we're talking about art now as an act of villain accord with a mature conscience. It's that mature part is the kicker in there, which is this question of can you act within the realm of what you know conscionably? Can I ask you? So that, that, that's quite different because it, it does keep your conscience quite independent in terms of, of the way that uh, your, your mind may be structured. But on the other hand, you have to incorporate the knowledge that you have in order to have that act. And so it's acting at the outer limits of your own knowledge. So that means that knowledge becomes very important. So as I have matured, I also think that the maturity of my conscience has matured. So those decisions are about awareness, for example, of, of manipulation of the genome. To me, I don't consider it just moral. I consider it irrational. And so. Um, many of these things, such as nuclear winter, are actually irrational acts. It's, it's somehow the Enlightenment having turned back on itself from rationality to irrationality. And that irrationality, you might call it morality and, and calling for rationality in the face of that, but that's, that is, cannot be exclusive of, of, of what I'm talking about. So that's part of the problem is, is that what's considered rationality in terms of the self-destructiveness, say, of civilization and the way that it might, might actually destroy itself, to me, is irrationality. And so that irrationality, would you call that rebellion or defiance of that act of, uh, of irrationality morality? Well, you might call it that. But it, it's certainly part of the act of maturity that we're talking about. And so I can't, sorry, I can, just can't differentiate between what I see as wholly irrational acts, like the self-destruction of society, or wholly irrational acts, like Lebensraum, for example. You know, there's so many irrational acts in the 20th century that were rationalized. And that is one of the aspects of the age of agriculture that I really criticize, and, and criticize for the last 25 years is the ability to rationalize it in ways that you come to the contradiction that what you've actually rationalized is actually something highly irrational. Thanks. It's really quite amazing. You just pass the mic over to Sarah. Nope. And then we're going to Asmina, and then Jenny, and then Jennifer. I'd, I had a question. I just wanted to bring it back to your ideas of the art market. Um, something I'm a trend very early I'm seeing is that young artists are taking art and it's being taken away from the traditional canonical institutions, the galleries, the museums, um, and in large part the universities. Um, the new art's being created 
and dispersed in airports at concert festivals. And in my case, it's, um, it's being shown in professional sports stadiums. So um, I guess sort of wanted to get a, a comment on what you thought, because so many of the problems that art history is dealing with, um, I think is be has the re become a result of the institutions and the regimented way that they've controlled the knowledge, the canon, and the tradition of sort. And now that it's very slowly moving away from those uh, places, how might that, and in specific reference to your park, how might that be in the future? Mm. I guess I have to ask you a question. Because there's a weighted question to that, and to what you're saying is, is that um, what is the perception of commodification by the Dallas Cowboys? The perception of commodification? The art is, um, it's a publicly displayed private collection. Is it, yes, but are they, is, it, is it done for the purpose of, of commodification or not? These are the questions, yes. because now what you're doing is, is you're walking into the middle of something that's completely commodified, which is... Professional sports. And yeah, yeah. And, and, so at what point does that stop being another piece of public relations that's just part of the commodification? And so doesn't that trap the artist right at, at the outset that um, they're now in a position of having their work exposed to the largest amount of audience at the particular time, but in the interest of it being commodified? So I don't know how you get around that particular one. That, that, that's a biggie. And, and how do the artists get around that particular thing? So it seems to me that that's a contradiction that you're raising that is, is very different than what I'm trying to do, which is like do something that's liberated from it if I can. You know? And maybe you know, after I'm gone, maybe it can't be done, but at least while I'm alive, I'm trying to do it. I think that the point that I, not so much the commodification in that venue, but that these are people that you know, are not usually the type that they're intimidated to go into the Met or MoMA or the Dallas Fort Worth Museum. These are people that go to monster truck rallies and people that go to uh, country music concerts. Mm -hmm. They're going to be exposed to art that they may not have ever originally seen had it not been there or had it not been in a public place like other sculpture parks um, in larger cities. But I do recognize that the commodification of that uh, place, but I think what I wanted to, to get at was the draw away from the institutions. I think a more important question that would be to turn that on the head is, is, is there a value of art beyond commodification? That's a general question, yeah. because if the answer is no, then it's just fine. <laughs> no, seriously. Mm -hmm. You know, all this criticism that I have of the existing art world, once, once you accept commodification as, as the outcome of art, you know, that it will become commodified and it is a product like any other product, mm -hmm. maybe it has a different audience or uh, otherwise, then it's self-fulfilling, then it's just fine. I'm arguing about a perception of art that I've had since I was very young, that it was a special place where, uh, a, a sacred place in a way, where it was beyond commodification. But, I, you know, Am I right? No, I can't, I can't honestly say that I have a prescription for that. That's only an expression of how I feel about it. So that's, that's difficult to answer your question otherwise. And I can't answer it for them either, right? Yeah. Um, I'm just going to move on to Asmina. Which is, yeah. um, so I just want to actually make a, a comment first. Is that the act of creativity itself is an act of great courage because it invites both rejection and acknowledgement. And with the rejection, you know, that, I mean, an artist puts themselves out and it's a, it's a space of vul great vulnerability, first of all. And I also want to bring something that this week at, just prior to coming here, I was involved in an Islamic art um, exhibition, and they were the Mughal gardens, and you know the way that 
the actual um, landscaping is a form of art too because it's manipulated. And the Mughal gardens were, you know, they were manipulated in terms of you had the four um, gardens that sort of represent four seasons. You've got the waterway, or the, you've got water as a symbol of purity, and then you've got walkways. And within the Mughal garden, people came and they were able to reflect and admire. And it's, it's actually a place of, of deep contemplation. So when I look at this park, I saw, I'm feeling the comparison that the landscape has also been manipulated so that you know the type of trees you've planted, the type of ponds that are put in, you know, and then the sculptures themselves, it becomes a very, very sacred area where people can actually dialogue with the space and the art and the artist. And so it does become a space of reflection. So it becomes greater than the actual art. It becomes an entire space. So I just wanted to comment on that. Thank you, Ismina. Uh, we're going to take two more. Uh, one from Jenny, Jenny Pace Purnell. And Jenny, I, I wonder if you'd mind uh, also perhaps if, if you have any thoughts on what Sarah brought up about art in outside of the canonical spaces, if you, if you do have any thoughts. Um, first, I think it might be helpful just uh, Could you speak up? Yeah, I think it might be helpful to point everyone to your foundational essay where uh, you define conscience and group consciousness, um, because there are many philosophers who use these terms in different ways, and uh, Karun and Jeff have, have developed terms that really are rooted in a, a genetic understanding Right, of the, or evolutionary understanding, is that, is that correct to say? I'm not sure, I, I, I put myself on the list. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. Um, okay, so I also wanted to say though, I think um, Jeff, like, just thinking back about your insights, several of them here, uh, and past discussions we've had, that um, this issue of artists in dialogue with predecessors, um, I wonder if maybe it's, if it's essential um, that an artist be apart from culture, uh, you know, sort of contemporary culture in dialogue with other artists and that is, that is one way of developing this level of maturity that it takes to sort of speak out, um, help, you know, the population evolve as you've said is necessary in times of great distress after the war after you know, the threat of nuclear winter, um, just in trying to sort of summarize maybe sort of some of your ideas here and the questions that are coming out. Um, maybe if it's, this is a way for an artist to um, step outside of a con contemporary culture um, that's very difficult, um, communing with other artists of the past, um, to then again make this sort of humanist statement uh, that helps people evolve in the way that other institutions can't do. You think it's possible? I think that's that's possible aim, at least in the well, process. That may be important. the aim, but do you think it's possible? That's really the question. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's the question that I have. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, and and that's essentially the question that sits out here. Is it possible to actually have a place where that can happen? I mean, I think, I think artists of the past have also had that conviction, or shared that conviction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then uh, we have Jennifer. Hi. Um, we've heard you speak, you quite often use, sorry. Um, we've quite often heard you use the term original art and you sort of speak about creating original art, and I was wondering um, how you think about that and how you define what is original art as opposed to, like, unoriginal art, and, like, who, de who determines that? Because you also speak a lot about, like, the individual conscience and, and it's sort of mapping the soul and that sort of thing, and for an individual artist, um, if it's an internal judgment, then a certain feeling or thought might be original because it's 
never occurred to them before. But if it's an externally judged thing, then, you know, other people might say, well, that's not original. And I was wondering, you know, how do you think about what is original and who decides what is original art? That's a really good question because when I formulated that, I had a, a very strong purpose in formulating that idea. And that was that it would be self-measuring within the artists that they themselves would know and that they would be self-judgmental on that particular issue. And that's what I wanted, was a self-judgmental definition of art, that no one else, it was, a pres it was not a prescription, but rather something that the individual artists could use to measure themselves and their own honesty about who they were and what they had accomplished. Because I really believe that only the artist internally knows whether or not they cross that line into original art. It, it, this isn't about the viewer. This is about the internal workings of the artist. And I wanted a description or a way of communicating what the artist might do as a set of criteria to measure himself, herself, doesn't matter. So yes, that, that's really relevant. And yes, that really was a purpose for that definition. Thanks. I took myself off the list, but I'm putting myself back on the list. <laughs> and I'm going to put... Uh, both uh, Dr. J and Dr. Winter uh, to work for me. Um, hopefully you consent. just want to go back to your concept of disclosure because I think it's interesting. I've, been, I've had a lot of time to think about this idea of uh, witnessing and uh, emergence. And I think, I wonder how closely you personally think the notion of disclosure uh, parallels that specifically in terms of whether or not the object is disclosing something, so not the subject. Um, and I wonder if we can construct, uh, or if I could propose, uh, you think about whether it would be useful to pair this idea of disclosure, which I think parallels my concept of emergence of the identity of the object of art or whatever you're working on, to the, per the conscious subject, um, which then has to respond to that. Um, it, and sometimes it's surprising. If you've, ever, if you've ever engaged in a creative pursuit, you sometimes are surprised that the object of your creation becomes something that talks back to you. Um, perhaps not surprising to people who are creative. Um, so it happens all the time. I've been, so the, the question is there, is, there is definitely that sense on the one hand, on the object side, um, and then there's what you do with it. So uh, are you passive? Are you active? How do you, how do you work on that? And is, if, if you subscribe to the idea that we have freedom, uh, degrees of freedom of action in our behavior, then that I would submit as a good stand-in for will. So let's call it, you know, relative degrees of freedom of doing, you know, you can choose this or that. Um, is that not a way of, of marrying, so to speak? I'm assuming that you've brought up Heidegger because you think that it's useful. Um, is that not a way of taking that uh, and, and, and making it compatible with or, or at least informing the definition that, that Jeff has, mm -hmm. has proposed. Um, so that's one, one thing. So then, then the will part of the equation becomes what the subject does. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to Jay, I wanted to, you, I felt like you, you, were on, you, had, you were on a path and I wanted to just ask you to, perhaps after uh, Dr. Jay has responded, whether <laughs> Dr. Winter could, uh, further your thought on what the consequence would be of a social conscience. What, what, that, what does that mean? So instead of asking the question, you tell me what you, your idea is. I want to hear what your idea is. Um, and I also want you to tell me what you think the difference between uh, the social uh, matrix that I think you're getting at and this idea of culture um, or couture. What, I think you know what I'm talking about. Mm. So if you could just clarify that, uh, trying to differentiate between culture and or couture and, and the social matrix in terms of the construction of conscience, mm. that would be great. So 
we'll take one and then the other? <laughs> uh, well, you've asked an enormously uh, complex question. What is disclosed? Uh, I mean, first of all, I, I, I uh, brought Heidegger into the conversation not because I'm in any serious sense convinced Heideggerian, but because it moves us away from the subject, uh, the artist as the uh, dominant and creative uh, will expressive subject, to something that uh, is outside of the intention of the artist. Now, what that something is, what is disclosed, uh, first of all, there's no one formula. So Heidegger may have emphasized something as grandiose as being. I, I'm not uh, myself willing to uh, operate very much on that level. But there are many other things that are potentially disclosed. Um, we haven't, the word beauty has never been mentioned. You know, and it's always interesting. Beauty is a kind of taboo word. I mean, some recent uh, theorists, uh, Lane Scarry and uh, you know, Wendy Stein, are trying to bring it back. But beauty is a word that now, uh, in our vocabulary, is, uh, ceases to be very effective. But there's something, I mean, this is, uh, maybe it's more sublime than beautiful in certain respects, but it is a beautiful setting. And so to think seriously about what beauty is, is disclosed by certain works of art. Not all works of art. Some are ugly, some are deliberately counter-beautiful. But that's one thing. Another thing that's disclosed, and this comes back to James's point, is the, the institution of art. In other words, what constitutes um, that category, and who gets in, and how does it change over time, and what, who are the gatekeepers, and who are the disseminators, and who judges. So you know, the, 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 the context in which these objects are placed and viewed is part of a network. And so what's disclosed to some extent is that. Then also, what's disclosed is historically variable in terms of our relationship to what has come before and after. So these are works that are, in, I mean, maybe this is a, a too compartmentalizing, but expressive of a certain moment of high modernist sculpture, a moment which had its uh, great day with Smith, lots of other figures. Uh, it's not the moment that is, I think, at the top of the art market or the cutting edge of the, so installations or you know, sites, with different kinds of work, uh, performance art, uh, may have sort of surpassed the idea of the single object in a uh, setting of a museum or whatever. So there's an historical disclosure. There's something about when the sensibility of the artist was formed, uh, a sense of these uh, works being expressive of that moment. So those are, I would say, among the things. And then to answer the question about the beholder or the viewer or the, uh, not the subject who makes, but the subject who appreciates and judges and so forth, here too there may be uh, an even overcoming of the subject-object distinction, that we may find ourselves immersed in something that's more primordial, more uh, basic than the subject looking from afar at an object. And it may situate in this larger natural context. It may, I mean, I, it's powerful. I mean, I, I say this without you know, false flattery. To be able to see um, these objects both dwarfed by the larger environment and also in some ways courageously asserting themselves against it without being intrusive, uh, without being uh, in some way a violation of it. So one gets an interesting dialectic of natural beauty and uh, artificial beauty. Uh, you know, the context of the human, which, uh, you know, it's hard to do. I mean, I think that sometimes these two are not so easily juxtaposed. So, th so these, I would say, are among the many disclosures that, uh, you know, just in my brief experience here, I've sort of felt uh, are, in fact, shown. I'll try again to make three, three points. The first is, I believe the discussion of the next two on the Blauer writer moment will show the nature of conscience, shared knowledge. That there is an inherent social act we are going to observe in the work of the Blauer writer. Having an almanac means getting somebody aware, making someone aware of what he or she might not have known, whether it's the you know, the Russian icons or the, the painted glass or God knows what. It can be, it can be a, a range of things that have uh, uh, importance by virtue of their dissemination. That, that's another word for disclosure. Uh, so I, I think the, the Blauer writer moment is, is uh, a demonstration of the social nature of the conscience of a group of artists in the early 20th century who were very well aware of the need to share their, um, their individual uh, genius. 
um, very strong personalities. Kandinsky uh, is, is not the least of them. Um, that's the first point, that we're here, I think, to criticize, but engage with a group of people expressing a social conscience. And I'll call it that, because I believe that's close to what he meant by the Geistige. That's what uh, Kandinsky, I think, meant in some ways. And the second point comes right out of the first. It strikes me that one of the um, social natures of conscience um, is the expression of uh, the sacred in art. And we cannot define the sacred separate from the institutions that have been its home for millennia uh, in whatever form that happens to be. It strikes me that artists are now the carriers of the sacred once the sacred has left the churches. Uh, and that, as such, the disclosure is of the hidden God, is of the hidden sacred nature of, well, whatever you want to call it. I don't know, but the, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think we need Heidegger for that. But we can say that the, the concept of art as expressing sacred uh, themes is, is something that no longer depends upon a population of uh, pratiquants, of communicants, of, uh, of church-going people, whatever it is. That's the second point. Um, and the third point that I would like to raise is that there is absolutely no reason to assume that the word social is, uh, is unitary. Uh, I presume that people have multiple consciences and multiply uh, differentiated uh, notions of, um, of their integrity as human beings. I mean, your integrity as an artist is something that I've admired to express it in your work is a very, as you, as you were saying, very vulnerable, a very risky operation. But I take the concept of conscience to be just as multiple as the, conscience, as the concept of identity. We don't have one. Uh, we have multiple ones. And they frequently co collide with each other uh, so that we are, um, you know, a, a mature consciousness might be the conscience, conscience or consciousness, they can accept the contradictions. But I do believe that those contradictions are socially inscribed, that we know about them because of language, art being one language, but not the only one. Uh, and the, the music is a, another instance that I think ex exhibits a social um, uh, being by virtue of the notation and the shared uh, concept of a, of, a, of a scale or of what a composition happens to be and we accept the social nature of music, I would simply like to urge you, Jeffrey, or urge us to consider that the same thing is going on in art, uh, and that we are shared, we are people who share these very deep and maybe genetically related matters with other people. And the fact that we all have them, these genes, strikes me as the biological framework for making conscience social. I think I'll stop there. Very interesting. Uh, lots to think about. I wanted to just ask if there's any other uh, panelists who have a comment or a question to share. We're just about at the end of the day. Uh, or anybody, uh, any students or guests? Yeah. Can I ask a very good question. Um, you're speaking about the, the beginnings of modernism, and you, you mentioned Donatello's Mary Magdalene. And I just wanted to know what, so, what you find so special I mean, it's obviously a beautiful work of art, but what did you see in it? It was a question of the fusion that he was... What I see as an artist is, and what I, I measure is when the, the subject, object disappears, they become one and the same, they're fused. And uh, that doesn't happen in that just doesn't happen in a lot of pieces of things. This one happened in terms of its fusion. Its fusion um, also, in my mind, was heretical. It was definitely a piece of heresy. The, um, uh, and, and I talked about that last year, was that the brilliance of the, uh, the, brilliance of the Roman Empire was to continue itself. It was failing at its patrician level because they were eating a lot of lead and they were really falling to pieces. It was carried on 
on a theological theme. They co-opted this uh, religion of slaves and turned it into a new Roman Empire. And in so doing, what they did was, I, I don't know if it's happened anywhere else in the world, they took a spiritual monopoly at that point, and they actually took a spiritual monopoly. that They had the control over how anyone would be able to approach anything that was spiritual. They defined it. So what I saw Donatello doing was actually taking that into his own hands and taking into his individual self in doing so was pure heresy. And that, that was supported by the Medici, which they were very strongly in favor of that happening. So that's why, and it's that fusion is, is really why I call that the first step in modernism. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I was wondering uh, if we have not been this afternoon a little bit too occidental. And uh, we are here at a place where First Nation were living. And uh, I have the impression that when you put aside the children, and I understand at the same time the raw art, out of the crazy or, or this kind of art, you push also the primitivism in a way and the colonial um, in heritage, which was so important for the people beginning with Gauguin, probably, and up to the Blue writer and, and after. And if we think that children, like they put in the almanac, crazy that they don't put in the almanac, and it's very interesting that they didn't think about it. And all the colonial people, they were seen as colonial people, and they were calling primitivism and we call now our premier in French, uh, sort of, a, yeah, first people. Uh, I think perhaps the state of conscience and the act of conscience would be very different than in our Occidental philosophy. Mm. I think that state genu genuinely just as we said, it, it changed in, in the case of Simon de Beauvoir. So, oh, all right. I, I'm, I'm not sure I entirely understood the question, but if I did understand the question, it was, um, would be the difference in the cultural view of conscience. Okay, now that you asked a very complex question, so I, I'm trying to sort out which part of it. It, it seems like it's got to be answered in two parts. Um, the conscience of the people whose work they adopted, is that one of the issues that's there? And how to no. know? Okay. And that, do you want to restate your question? Because I think <laughs> audio-wise, we couldn't hear it over here. Just put it really close to your mouth. Like that? Um, I had the impression that we were stuck in a kind of uh, uh, very interesting questions, but which were very occidental. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mean European? Uh, yeah, it's what I mean. No. But, I mean European and Ameri I mean North American. <laughs> and. Uh, and it, this was uh, promoted by what you said, you answered to my first question by, by the children have, have, don't have this state of conscience. Mm. And immediately I thought, yeah, but in the Blue Writer, they put children out in front, and to, uh, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, I will show some. Uh, and they are going all over the world, all over the genders, except for women, their personal women, not the others. Uh, and all over the space and all over the times, like you do with times. You go to prehistory and you go mm. till, till now. But you wanted to push aside with children, I had the impression, the rest of the world in a way. You take all the time 
in the European tradition, if you can say that LASCO is a European tradition, it's ridiculous, but see what I mean. And you take out the rest of the space. Mm. Um, so the question is whether you Yeah, firstly, I, I admit to the prejudice of, of, of being in favor of European art. I, I think that the That's liberation, the concept of liberation is a European concept. I don't we, see that, that concept anywhere else really in the world. So I see other people actually following a cultural tradition which is almost a requirement within their tribal culture in order to continue it. It's a, you are a little bit on the, what Jay was saying about the sacred. Oh, I think that I think that because what the, the artist did. Religious. I think what the artist did, uh, and, and what I mean by um, European art and its liberation, and that fusion, and that view of original art, is sacred. I mean, it's sacred within the recognition of the artists themselves, but it's not sacred in a prescriptive manner. And so this is where Jay and I part ways in many different ways, is, is that, uh, I th I th as, I, as I think, is that you tend, tend to have a tendency more to go towards prescription. Yes. And I go absolutely the opposite way than prescription. So I think that this fusion in the sacred is free of prescription, is, is a state free of prescription. And that is very rare because I think that prescription grows out of tribalism. Tribalism itself defines prescriptions that, to me, are absolutely murderous. These are, if we can't overcome the, the nature of our prescriptions, then we will constantly take ourselves to the irrational, to the states of high irrationality. And that state of high irrationality has grown to the incredible destructive power that we have as to what it means to overstep. I mean, the First World War is the first indication of it. The Second World War gets even worse, and from here on in, it's only going to get worse. So that's why I, I said overcoming the, the, the tribal is, is the scream against the tribal prescription, that the art is that, because I don't see it as prescriptive. I think that its sacredness lies without prescription, and that most sacredness exists exist from prescription. And so the independence and, and the liberation that I see is to be free of that prescription and still remain sacred. Mm. Sounds like we have some more things to discuss and some more debates. I'd like to give both the audience and the panel a round of applause.